Hey, how's it going guys? Captain Cuba here, and today I'm getting back into the theorizing spirit. Up until now I've been mostly focusing on doing videos regarding small details seen in the God of War Ragnarok trailer. And after two videos of doing this, I think I'm officially done. I don't think there's any more details left to find in the trailer, but who knows, I might revisit this topic again and find something interesting. For now, let's focus on theories. The first one being about the identity of the new dwarf, Durlin. As I said in my first trailer breakdown, the name Durlin is nowhere to be found in Norse mythology. The closest we can get to a dwarf is either Durin, who according to Norse mythology was the second created dwarf, the first being Moxungnir, whose body we find in the first game. The other possible dwarf is Dalvin, who is credited with teaching the dwarves how to use runes for writing. Both of these dwarves are also responsible for creating one of the most powerful weapons in Norse mythology, the sword Tyrfing. A sword that's capable of cutting through anything, as well as coming with the curse of killing someone every time it was drawn. But whether Durlin is either Durin or Dalvin is not really a concern to me. It's possible that he might be both characters glued together. And the reason I say we shouldn't concern ourselves with who he is in Norse mythology is because Santa Monica is known for taking these famous characters and making them their own. Which is one of the things I love about this series. Which is why I think it's better to work with the information we get from the trailer as well as the character portrait. The first thing we have to talk about is the realm he's from, Svartalheim, Land of the Dwarves. No one is really arguing about this point. What I find interesting about this realm is how the book Lore and Legend says that Atreus has heard rumors of this realm being a dark and smoky place lit only by the fires of the forges. But now we know this is not the case. Svartalheim looks very similar to Midgard, with the only difference being how much water there is. Which is why we see so many seafaring equipment scattered around the realm such as buoys and nets. All of these items can be found inside Durlin's home as well. But he's the only dwarf we know of at the moment to have some kind of sea creature crawling around his house as well as a squid by the name of Dinner who has the job title of administrative assistant. Based on all these items we know that much like his dwarven brother, Durlin is a man of the sea. The only difference with Durlin is that he might have traveled to other pantheons. This is something that one of my discord members discovered while looking closely at all the images of Durlin. The one detail that made me want to make this theory video was the dragon head figurine at the end of one of his scrolls. Mike has pointed out the similarities of this dragon to those of the Aztec or Mayan pantheon. This might even be a representation of Quetzalcoatl, the feather serpent deity. Durlin also seems to have a scroll with a crocodile tooth from the Egyptian pantheon. This wouldn't be too crazy to believe, since Egyptian symbolism in the God of War series can be found everywhere, including Tyr himself. Now something else I noticed the other day while discussing the community's theories is that Durlin has what looks to be a bonsai tree in his home. This is a tree grown on a pot that is artificially prevented from reaching its normal size. This artistic practice originated in China, not Scandinavia. These three details give evidence to the theory that Durlin has visited other pantheons before. Perhaps all of the scrolls around his home are records or stories from other pantheons he has had the pleasure to interact with. If this is the case, I beg you Santa Monica Studios, Please let me read them. I will spend hours reading stories of Durling running away from Quetzalcoatl or some other type of mythological creature. Now the other thing that I want to point out is that this isn't the first time we've seen an environment full of references to other pantheons. In the first game we are introduced to Tyr's Temple, a place where we see items from every single pantheon. Mimir tells us this is the case because people from all over the world loved Tyr so much that they would bring him gifts from their lands. So is it possible there might be a connection between Tyr and Durlin? I think there is. And the proof can be found in one of the tapestries in Tyr's temple. This one. Here we see Tyr giving the Greek people... something. That's not really important at the moment. What's important is the form of travel he used to arrive in Greece. A ship. And what did we already establish about Durlin? He's a man of the sea. So my theory is that Tyr hired Durlin as a ship captain for his travels around the world. This would explain why Durlin has all of these mythological items in his home. They didn't bring it to him like they did for Tyr. He stole them during his travels. This might explain why he has a giant scar on his head. He might have attempted to steal an Egyptian god's weapon, but got caught and the god bonked him on his head, resulting in a massive scar. I've come to the conclusion he stole them because for the most part in Norse mythology, dwarves are represented as greedy creatures. Their most obvious example is Fafnir who turned into a dragon. Even in God of War 2018, Mimir ponders the idea of Brock stealing Kratos' blades for a moment. Real quick, give me your blades. Why? Yeah, I said I'd help you and I aim to. Come on! Oh, my equipment's in Midgard. Be right back. Yeah. You don't suppose he'd make those, do you? 
It is still too early to tell whether this theory is correct or not. The best way to know for sure is to wait for the game to come out, then use a lot of photo mode inside his house. Or simply wait for him to confirm this theory. But whether this theory is correct or not, you have Mike Hu to thank for it. He truly has done most of the legwork looking up all of this information. I get a lot of theories sent to me via the comments section, Discord, and even Twitter. But it's not often that I find one that really blows my mind. This one really does, so props to you, Mike. Now, I don't want you guys to think that I don't have any video ideas of my own. For my next video, I might try to predict the entire story of the next game. I know, I know, that's a bold video to make, but I think you guys are really gonna like what I have in store for you guys. After that, I have a set of smaller points that I need to talk about. I wanna do a proper character portrait breakdown, another video about the Valkyries, and much more. So if you're interested in God of War content here on YouTube, I am your guy. So with that said, I want to thank all of my channel members for making this channel possible. People like Davy Jones, Hamza Kaj, and Amol Arwal, sorry if I mispronounced that, to name a few, are one of the big reasons this channel is still alive. So from the bottom of my heart, thank you. I would also like to thank everyone who likes and shares my videos. It doesn't seem like much, but it really does help. So with that said, thanks for watching, and remember, go forth in the name of Ragnarok.